All right. Well, I think that we sort of have a critical mass of attendees. So I would like to say thank you uh, and welcome to our annual meeting this evening. Um, as you know, this was intended to, uh, to be in April, which seems a million years ago to me now. Um, and when we first started talking about our annual meeting, especially the fact that it was going to be the celebration of our 50th anniversary, um, I think during that conversation, I don't think any of us quite anticipated that we were going to be having a virtual Zoom meeting in August. So, um, but here we are. Um, I was just sharing uh, earlier that I had the opportunity to um, have a Zoom webinar recently with our founder, Henry Lee. And uh, as always, Henry continues to amaze me with his ability to adapt and be open to things um, and inspire me. So uh, I hope we'll do as well as, as he did the other evening. Um, I want to just take a few minutes before I talk to you about the Zoom guidelines this evening to thank all of you uh, for your support uh, during this time. It has been sort of unprecedented, which I know is a phrase everyone seems to be using these days. Um, but it has been a time that we are so, um, we realize that our parks are no longer really an amenity, that they've become a necessity to us for a quality of life here uh, in the city. And so your support is crucial to all the work that, uh, that we do in the parks. And so I wanna say thank you. Um, and during this unusual time, it was my time in the parks and at time uh, having the opportunity to see you from a distance uh, or behind a mask or even little notes sharing how much you were enjoying those moments of, of being in our parks. So um, with that, I, I do wanna thank you. Um, I miss not seeing you all in person. We talked about the lack of connectivity with Zoom. Um, I always look forward to the opportunity when we have these meetings to see our members because um, it, it excites me and it re-energizes re me for the, the challenges that we face all the time. And I love your feedback and I will definitely miss that today. Um, I'd also like to say thank you as well um, to all of the, uh, the members of our Friends of the Public Garden office, our office staff and our park staff. Um, they have been uh, inspiring in their ability to be creative and to adapt to our new situation and be incredibly um, helpful uh, and, and working remotely. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, in the ways that they have been able to shift gears and change things and keep, keep us all uh, moving ahead. So the other thing I'd like to talk to you about today is we have some really exciting news to share with you. As you know, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. And what's been clear to us is that we have been fortunate with um, passionate leadership from our executive director, Liz Visa. And Liz is celebrating 11 years this year. Um, and as you know, has been driving so much these last few years, heading up our challenges with uh, the challenge to sunlight and our shadow laws with Winthrop Square, being at the forefront of advocacy for our new memorandum of agreement with the city, which we're incredibly thrilled about, uh, which is just the beginning of deepening our relationship with the Parks Department of the city. But Liz has been driving so much of this, as well as the advocacy, not only for our parks, but for parks within the city. We ended up taking this opportunity um, to look at the structure of the Friends, and I wanna thank a subset of our board uh, who did a lot of work on this. And we're very, very excited to announce this evening that Liz Visa um, has been uh, promoted to be the president of the Friends of the Public Garden. So congratulations, Liz. Um, we're all thrilled and, and appreciative of all of your time and passion. If I could just ask Laura to go back, I'll just get a couple housekeeping rules. Many of you are all experts, I'm sure by now on Zoom guidelines. All non-presenters will be muted during the meeting. This evening, we're going to uh, have a call for two votes. So there will be a poll and we'll give you each a couple moments to be able to complete that poll. And we'll thank Laura McCure from our office who will uh, organize all of that for us. 
we encourage you to use the chat functionality, which is in the middle bottom when you mouse over your screen, and to type in any questions that you may have during the meeting. And just a note that the meeting's being recorded so that others who are not able to join us this evening can watch it at a later date, and we'll share a link on our webpage. But with that, um, I want to say thank you. Um, one of the things I'd like to also uh, acknowledge is our incredible uh, memorandum of agreement that we signed this year with the city. We're very, very fortunate this evening that our Parks Commissioner, uh, Ryan Woods, has been able to join us this evening. Um, and I'd like to ask Ryan uh, if he has a moment, uh, if he might say a few words. Ryan? Hi, everyone. Um, hope I'm coming in and you can hear me. I don't know if you can see me, um, but at least hear me. Uh, just want to say happy 50th. I know this is not the uh, 50th anniversary that we had hoped for this year. Um, we started off the year, as Leslie mentioned, on a positive note with on January 10th signing officially the first uh, MOU with a real action plan and maintenance plan attached to it. If you haven't seen the document, it really spells out the plan in each of the three parks month by month with the roles of the friends, the roles of the city, and there's no more gentlemen's agreements, handshakes, et cetera. It really spells everything out. And it was a true um, project that took many, many years. And really Liz and Leslie drove that project that took tons of time. And that's, you know, just, I can't even go into all the details, all the minutiae around it, but they really drove that project and got it through. So we're very excited. This is the first official one we have. We have 161 different friends groups um, throughout the city in our park system, but by far the friends of the public garden are the leader. Um, they are the one that we, when everybody asks how to do something, we say, you know, why don't you call over to Liz or to the office to figure out how they went about doing this or how they organized this initiative or that initiative. So it really is an example um, to all the other 160 groups out there. The friends play a vital role in this partnership that we're greatly appreciative to through partnership, through stewardship, and through your advocacy. We're gonna to continue to partner this year on two exciting projects. One, we're in the midst of the Boston Common Master Plan, which we're working with uh, Weston and Sampson Design Group. We expect to have that wrapped up at the, be at the end of this year, um, around November, December. And then once we have that plan, we'll now be able to go through that and phase out projects and figure out what funding we need, what additional philanthropic, uh, philanthropic efforts we need to come in, um, for projects, is it the areas of the frog pond? Is it pathways? Um, you know, how are we gonna improve different areas of the common? So we're really looking forward to figure out how once we have this master plan in hand, we can phase that out uh, appropriately. And then the one that everyone's uh, most familiar with is the restoration project of the 54th Regiment Memorial. That again is also happening and should uh, return to the park at the end of this year. We're very excited about it. It's been getting a lot of positive press. And this is a partnership between the Friends of the Public Garden, the National Park Service, the City of Boston, and the Museum of African American History. And we're really grateful to have this partnership together um, to accomplish this national treasure that is in America's first park. Um, we value this partnership more than ever. We are hurting with a lack of programming in our parks this year um, with having events right now of less than 50 people. We miss the programming by the Brewer Fountain. We miss having the swan boats this year. So our partnership is really gonna get us through. So we look forward to working through all these challenges with you and moving forward. So thank you everyone. Congratulations on 50 years. And again, I wish we were celebrating in person, but um, thanks for everyone for getting together and for all the leadership for the Friends of the Public Garden. Thank you. Ryan, thank you very much. Yes, it's not what we envisioned, but um, we're looking forward to the next 50. Um, we'd also like to take this opportunity to thank a number of our elected officials, um, many of whom are joining us this evening. Uh, District Councilor Kenzie Bach, District Councilor Ed Flynn, our at-large counselors as well, um, who've been incredibly engaged and supportive of the work that we're doing. Uh, Representative Jay Livingstone, Aaron Miklowitz, John Santiago, who I understand was not feeling well, so we're sending you our best wishes, uh, Senator Joe Von Corey, and Senator Will Brownsberger. Again, he's not feeling that well, not COVID, he tells me, but um, I'm sending you uh, healthy wishes as well, uh, Senator Brownsberger. So thank you to all of you uh, for the support and the engagement that uh, you provide us here at the Friends. So with that, um, 
I would like to ask uh, Kate Enroth. Um, first, I'm going to call for a vote, one of our first votes this evening. We'll see if the radio buttons work. Um, I'd like to call for a vote of the minutes of our previous annual meeting for the approval of March 28th, 2019. They have been provided, and I'll ask you to just take a moment to select yes, no, or if you abstain. So thank you. Oh, everyone's very quick, so thank you. Great, so I think that we now have a majority of votes. So I wanna appreciate, say, appreciate your efforts. We have uh, overwhelming yes, and so we move to approve those minutes. So do I hear a second? Second. Great, seems we're all in favor, so thank you. Now I'd like to call upon uh, Kate Enroth to give our governance report if she would, Kate. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I am Kate Enroth, and it's um, my real pleasure to speak to you as chair of the Governance Committee. Um, our Governance Committee was working this year, and we have six individuals that we all recommend to a term on the Board of Directors. Um, these six individuals, as you can see on the screen, James Bordewick, Claire Corcoran, Ann Mosju, Jeffrey Mullen, Brent Shea, and Eugenie Walsh. We would like to, um, we recommend them for a three-year term on the board. And so I'd like to make a motion um, in support of those individuals for a three-year term. I second it. Great. Terrific. All right. And shall we call for our next vote? Great. Excellent. So Kate, I think that that carries. That motion carried. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. And so with that, I think that we'll get on to our, our main report. And so Liz. I'm going to have Bill first. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. I jumped right past the most important thing. My apologies. Um, I'd like to introduce Bill Clendaniel. Many of you know who is our esteemed treasurer. Um, and now, again, as I said, for the most important part of our report, and I'm sure many of you are sort of interested um, in how things are happening uh, with our work this year with COVID. Well, this uh, report initially, of course, was for 2019, it was to be given in April. And I'm delighted that it was a very strong year. Uh, we had a 5% uh, increase in our income overall, uh, increased in our investment draw, thanks to the rising uh, markets. Um, we had uh, very uh, good results of uh, income from sponsored trees and benches in the parks. Um, we had set aside uh, monies from the previous year for projects that we could not complete in 2018. So we had money that came over and uh, gave us uh, a lot of help for projects in 2019. And public programs and revenue were all up. Support overall was down, uh, but only because we had two very significant gifts in 2018 that were not expected to be repeated. Um, but perhaps most importantly, membership was still up 3%. On the expense side, uh, we uh, increased our expenses 13% and put a record number of dollars into Parks Care, $269,000. And we also uh, had uh, $97,000 put into public programs largely uh, the programming around the 54th Regiment uh, restoration. And I hope many of you have seen the wonderful 
uh, programming that was done until it got blown down the other night, I heard. Um, and there will be programming through the year as well on that, educating all of us about the importance of this monument and the story that it memorializes. Uh, expenses were also up, um, very importantly for the future, because we added one new staff member, a Parks Care Specialist, Eric De Tommaso, who already uh, has proven to be uh, exceptionally useful. We've done all kinds of wonderful things that Liz is going to talk to you about in a few minutes. So that was uh, one of our increased expenses. But I'm happy to report that our administrative expenses stayed constant at 7% as they have for the last seven years. And when all was said and done at the end of the year, we were able once again to put some money uh, that we had planned to spend in 2019 and didn't get all our projects done for a variety of reasons. Uh, that money flowed over into 2020. I think it's very important to realize that uh, obviously uh, with a 50 year track record, any single year uh, of the Friends is not uh, stand alone. It's, it's an ongoing process of money flowing in and flowing out and sometimes uh, it takes two or three years to, to achieve our projects. As you will hear, we have some exciting new projects for next year. And uh, the endowment, which is very important to our fiscal stability, uh, was up 22% in 2019 and stood at 23.2 million at the end of the year. Now, we're in August and the world has been turned upside down in many ways. And so I thought, uh, although I would not usually report on the current year, um, I would say a few things because I'm sure you're all wondering how we're doing. Fortunately, we had very strong cash reserves at the beginning of the year. And it was clear that we were going to be able to keep all our staff uh, on full employment. And as you will hear, they've been busy, uh, even though it's remote, although in the case of the park care staff, they've been in the parks. We reduced our budget by about a third. We met um, to think how our income was going to drop, and it has dropped uh, considerably. Uh, we were very encouraged because so many of you were willing to make your gifts, uh, make your uh, ticket price, uh, ticket purchases for the green and white into gifts, even though there was no green and white. And that was very encouraging to all of us and, and helped sustain us through the year. Uh, membership renewals are on track, although uh, not surprisingly, new memberships are, are lagging slightly. And very importantly, we received some bequests, and we never budget this, but it emphasizes the importance of, of the work of our legacy society to have these gifts flowing in uh, from time to time and uh, adding uh, to our resources. We were able to continue our essential parks work, and so we uh, expended uh, significant amounts of money on that. And at the half year mark, we still anticipate, as we had budgeted, uh, a modest surplus. And as of July 31, the endowment stood at $23 million. So we remain in a very, very strong financial position. I will be stepping down as your treasurer in October after eight years. Uh, so this is my last report to you all. Uh, for over 40 years, I have worked uh, in a variety of capacities uh, with a wide array of Massachusetts conservation and preservation nonprofit organizations. But none of them have had more dedicated, devoted, and generous members than all of you. Your support of this wonderful and important organization, now 50 years old, has never flagged and is an inspiration to all of us, volunteers and staff alike. Together, we have built a financially strong institution whose mission to provide well-managed and beautiful landscapes in the middle of Boston for all 
has never been more important and indeed today I think we can say essential. Thank you. And now I'm turning the meeting over to our new president, Liz Beza. Thank you, Bill. And uh, yes, we hope to keep you close and thank you so much for eight wonderful years of, of being a treasurer. Um, we've uh, talked about the time of COVID here and this is where we are. It is an unprecedented moment. Um, but besides that, or despite that, as every other piece of civic infrastructure has closed down, our parks have remained open, welcoming, free, and I hope you've all gone to seek solace and renewal and rest there. It's been really inspiring to see people come and use it, come socially distancing and, and mask, but know this is a place for you, particularly at a time of stress like it is now. The public garden and the Boston Common are neighborhood parks for over 55,000 pe people, but they're not just neighborhood parks. They are parks for everyone. They are symbols of the city. They are icons of Boston. And it is really important for us to remember that they belong to all Bostonians. They should be welcome to come, and I hope they are welcome to come. And we need to be thinking about how we can make them welcome, as welcome as possible, that these parks are all of Boston's parks. They are also theaters for social change, in particular the Boston Common has been that for generations, for centuries. Um, it's a place where people come to make their voices heard, to speak truth to power. So there is not just uh, essential public health infrastructure, but these parks are essential political and social infrastructure as well. Um, they are threaded into, they are woven into de democracy. You know, Ohms had talked about tree as the parks as being democracy and trees and dirt, and they in fact are. And so we need to make sure that they are as resilient as possible for the intensity of use that they see and that we welcome. This is a time of reckoning for each and every one of us to confront and tackle the issues of systemic and historic injustices against black and brown communities. We put our statement of solidarity out this spring. We are committed to taking steps to, to live into that and to not make it just a statement, but make it actions. And these are some important steps that we are taking and that we are committed to take. We are in the process of creating and adopting a new strategic plan with the goal to build a more diverse and inclusive organization, including PARC, the board, the staff, and our partners. We have established a board staff DEI committee to identify concrete steps to work towards that goal. And one of the concrete steps, we are about to announce a new position, and that position will be um, advertised on diversity websites as well as other websites. We're scrutinizing the monuments in our parks. How can our position as park caretakers work to tell their full stories and interpret them honestly and critically? And what are the untold stories and how can we lift those up? Most importantly, we need to listen, we need to learn, and then we need to act. We wanna convene conversations with people of color from other city neighborhoods to understand better how our parks can become more inclusive and welcoming. And if people don't come and don't feel that they, these are their parks, we wanna know why. So we're committed to doing this work. Stay tuned for other steps and other announcements, but we are committed to walking this walk and not just talking the talk. Last year feels like a lifetime ago, 2019, but we want to talk about the wonderful work that we did last year and then some uh, work this year. Uh, we had a $2.9 million budget in 2019, and of that, $2.2 million went directly into parts care and programming. And as Bill said, we have an additional staff person, so we've doubled the number of people that do the work in the parks, and it's been terrifically helpful. We also want to thank all of you volunteers. I think we have some of you on the call. The Rose Brigade is in its 33rd year and socially distancing out there every Tuesday. The Board of Brigade is in its fifth year. The Eric has been overseeing that work wonderfully. They've been working all around the borders in the garden. And then our tour guides. I think we have a couple of tour guides on this, on this meeting call. I'm sorry that we can't have you in the, in the park and socially distanced uh, guide people around the park. You brought 500 people to the garden last year learning the untold stories of the public garden. And pretty soon you will get a, a link to a virtual tour that I have done. It's not the same as being in the park with your tour guides, but, but I've done a similar tour and you will be getting it um, in a link pretty soon. We have volunteers that come into the office. We have volunteers that help out at events. We thank you all. And I want to particularly say 
The board of directors in this organization is an incredible, dedicated, hardworking, I have never seen a board work as hard and as be as committed as the Friends Board is. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for that. And thank our council. We've done a wonderful job adding a council uh, eight years ago. We have great members of the council. A number of you are on the call today or in, in the meeting. Thank you so much for your efforts and members of our committees. We have 15 committees, so we have a lot of work and people come and join with us to make that work happen. As you heard several times, our staff is remote but hard at work. It's amazing how we've been able to quote pivot and, uh, and, and seamlessly move into this world. And we've had, we're having more meetings, more virtual meetings than we normally do because we're not running into one another in the office. So, but we're making it work and I'm really inspired by the team that you have uh, on behalf of this work in the parks. So let's start with the uh, beginning, under, under the, the uh, grass and the trees and, and all the things in a park and with soils. Soils are the building blocks of green space. Healthy soil is essential for healthy plants. They provide the nutrients, the oxygen, the water, and they support the root zones for healthy plants to thrive in our parks. And given that they are urban parks and are trampled upon a lot, it's really important that we have healthy soils. We do some soils work and the city has done soils work, but, but fundamental soil restoration work has not been done at any scale since 1910. And that's what you see on the left, a picture of the Olmstead brothers doing significant soils work on the common. So again, with uh, more support, we are able to do that. And on the lower left, you see baggies. Um, we collected soil from every panel of each of these parks, sent them off to get tested. And you see on the top, the, the uh, outcome of those tests of are we is the potassium and the phosphorus and the nitrogen, the pH levels good, or are there deficiencies? So this provides a, a backdrop at the, the beginning of a program that would be able to build on every year and understand how we're doing in terms of amending the soil and supporting its, its improvement. And you see on the bottom, uh, placing lime on one of the blocks, several of the blocks on the mall to uh, improve the pH. Grass is important in our parks and lawns. We've talked about this as grassroots advocacy because look at what lawns are being asked to do. Uh, we love what happens in our parks. It's wonderful that Shakespeare comes, then thousands of people come and enjoy uh, professional Shakespeare uh, for three weeks in the summer. Tens of thousands of people come to protest. And maybe one or two of you come and want to find that beautiful carpet or your outdoor living room to sit in or lie down and read a book. It's really important that lawns are in healthy and resilient shape. This is an example of something that we did in one of the lawn panels that we call it the Shakespeare panel. It's also a panel where off-leash dog use occurs and it has an intensity of use which meant that 80% of the um, green was weeds. 10% was turf that we'd want to see out there and 10% was bare ground. So we did a pretty radical restoration last fall. What you see on the top is we uh, placed horticultural vinegar to kill the weeds. Once the weeds were killed, it's going to take several seasons to do this. We um, aerated to break up the compacted uh, turf, the compacted soil, and brought in a, a more resilient uh, turf uh, seeding and then we put compost top dressing on it and added irrigation. So all those components add up to the image that you see on the bottom. So on the upper slide is uh, September 2019 and the bottom is early June of this year and you just see a, a real transformation in the turf. Another thing that we did in both the Boston Common and the Public Garden last year is add sod to the edges. Over 7 million people come to our parks every year. And if there's a large crowd, those crowds can move off the, the uh, path and onto the edges and those edges tend to uh, lose their, their turf. So we decided to sod it and we will be doing this on a regular basis and make sure that those turf edges are both in good condition and beautiful. We have 1,700 trees in all three of the parks, and you know that we have a regular program of pruning and fertilizing all the trees, but I wanna just talk about one tree in particular. We've talked about this tree before. It is the American icon, the American or the elm, and, and we have several different species of elms. We have about 400 elms in our parks, and we used to have several thousand elms before the elms in the, the country were decimated by the elm bark beetle, about uh, the Dutch elm disease, carried by the elm bark beetle. 
Um, Chris Healy is one of our amazing uh, couple, the Healy's at the Growing Tree, and she is an entomologist. Her husband is a uh, soil scientist and arborist, Norm, and they've been working with us for eight years. And they've been pioneering a new method and management method for controlling Dutch elm disease. What they've been looking at as the care is the carrier of the disease, which is the elm bark beetle. And what Chris is doing is putting a trap up on a tree. It's actually a control tree in, in the uh, Victory Gardens in the Fenway. But she's putting up the trap on a non-elm tree to confuse the elm bark beetles. To capture them, there is a sticky substance and a pheromone that attracts the beetle to the trap. And it helps them understand when the beetles are, are circulating in the park, where the concentration of the beetles are, and to eliminate beetles from the population, reduce the population in their park. So look at this. In 2014, they captured 40,000 beetles in their traps. And last year, they captured only 2,500. So it's been an enormous assistance to uh, controlling this disease, which will never be eradicated. Last year, we did not lose one elm to Dutch elm disease. And what Chris noticed uh, last year was that the elm, the elm bark beetles were smaller. So I think we're, we're uh, gaining and it means that we're doing integrated pest management. We can use less chemicals and more of an integrated pest management method. It is new in the industry, the way they are seeing and understanding the disease and how to attack it and treat it. So they are documenting it. We're, we're supporting their documentation of this and we'll be uh, bringing it out in both lay form and uh, professional form. It, it should change the industry once uh, people learn about this work. Over the last number of years you've seen in the in the garden and heard us talk about the uh, Boylston Street border work over 900 linear feet, uh, repairing, uh, adding plants there that we lost over the years and uh, solving a drainage problem that we had there. And now we've turned our attention to the Beacon Street border. We added new benches that you see on the upper left, taking out those green painted uh, and concrete stanchion benches and adding these. And also did a major planting at the entrance, uh, the Charles Beacon entrance, which is a, a major entrance to the garden and really lost a lot of its planting. So it's a wonderful improvement to that entrance into the garden. Moving to the mall, we have been working on the last block of the mall, the so-called Kenmore Mall block, which uh, is in pink, you can see, uh, after the Bowker overpass. So for the last three years, we've been working in close collaboration with the Parks Department and in a public process to identify opportunities and needs, working with the public and seeing what we can do to improve this, this block. Um, and what you see on the bottom is an image of existing shrubbery, which are old and overgrown and sheared. It prevents views in infrastructure in the mall, the, 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 the um, pathways and the T structures are uh, deteriorating and need improvement. And what we learned two years ago, this is a temporary art installation that uh, now and there brought to this block of the mall. And it was uh, called Open House concrete uh, st uh, furniture uh, reflecting the Gilded Age, but for the public. And what we saw is that people do want to sit here. They come and they would like to sit. There's a um, elder housing here. There is student housing. This is a rapidly growing neighborhood. And we heard loud and clear that people want more seating here as well. So this is the preferred plan on the top. Uh, an illustration of some of that on the bottom and the Lombard lamp, which is in the center of the mall, we're going to be pulling it off to the to the edge so that it will be sort of a, a signal and a welcome to people. The Parks Department this year has in their budget money for doing construction documents. So this is one wonderful example of our partnership. We're working closely to make this a reality. In 2019, we continued our cyclical care of the sculpture in the parks. On the left, the Collins Memorial. Uh, Garrison in the middle and the Women's Memorial on the right. Thank you to all of you who contributed to the Joan and Henry Lee Sculpture Endowment. It's allowed us to do this work and such that, as Bill said, we had to reduce the number of dollars we were spending this year because the, of the number of dollars we were not getting in because of having to cancel the green and white and other uh, issues around the pandemic. So we are taking the year off of that cyclical care, but the beauty of it is that we've been doing such a good job, regular care of these uh, monuments that they're okay to go for a year. The one that we are taking care of and working hard at where it's a significant restoration is the Shaw 54th, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But these are some of the monuments that we took care of last year. Ever since the beginning, the Friends has advocated for sunshine and against buildings that would uh, 
cast excessive shadow on the parks. In the 70s, there was a massive development that we fought throughout most of the 70s and had shadow laws, as you know, put in place in the 90s. Um, a couple of years ago, we had to uh, advocate against another development uh, of Winthrop Square. But the good outcome of that is that several commitments of the city, both uh, the master plan that you heard Ryan talk about, and I'll talk about in a, in a minute, and a plan for downtown to look at the, uh, the logical, thoughtful development of a very dense neighborhood in the city and protecting the two major green spaces that make this neighborhood and the city livable. We hired Raffi Siegel, who is a, an urban uh, planner from MIT, to help us do a first of its kind sunshine protection modeling for protecting these green spaces and we see applicability throughout the city. So we were looking at, and he looked at through this computer model, how tall buildings could be and still protect the existing sunshine on the parks. And here you see the gray are the two parks, the common and the garden. The yellow is the so-called sun fan. And those buildings that are popping up through the fan are buildings that cast shadows today. What this told us, which is really significant, is that there's a lot of development that can still occur downtown. We created a very fine-grained um, assessment of the topography on each block of the downtown. So it's a, like a sunshine topography and allows us to know how high buildings are able to be on every block of downtown and still not cast more shadow onto the parks. We uh, had a meeting with uh, BPDA planners last year and Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space, Chris Cook joined the meeting. It was a really positive meeting. There was a lot of interest in this, in this uh, model and there was opportunity to, to take this model and apply it to other urban public realm areas in the city. And as Chris said, it's an equity issue. So it's really exciting to see that this might become adopted by the city. As Ryan said, we're hard at work together on uh, reimagining America's first public park. We did a really uh, wonderful job last year going out to all the neighborhoods of the city, taking these parklets on the road and asking people, what do you need in the common? What do you like and what do you not like? We had two public meetings, we're well, very well attended, and in the world that we're living in, we're having an, uh, a virtual meeting on September 16th. What would normally be accomplished in one meeting, we're going to be taking six meetings to do. So we'll have one meeting where we all get together and, and present our proposals in response to your input about the park on different nodes of the park and system-wide issues. And then we're gonna be having four times for people to drop in and talk to us. We'll be um, it's like office hours and we'll be able to talk with you one-on-one -on -one or one on a small group to talk about these different areas and what your response is to our proposals to those areas. And then we'll come back in early October for a final public meeting together and use that feedback to continue on to create a final plan. If we need another public meeting, we will. We hope that we get a lot of feedback and, and, and uh, input from all of you and encourage everyone to come. The uh, promotions being, uh, uh, put out in the, in the city, we are gonna be having seven languages, uh, translating the, the, the major bullet points into seven languages. There are a lot of people with, which, which, uh, who come to, this, to the park who do not speak English, and we're looking forward to making sure that everybody has an opportunity to contribute to this conversation. One thing that is a wonderful part of the park and really transformed the park was when the city took the lead on restoring Brewer Fountain and then we took the lead on expanding that to restore the, the plaza and the landscape and then activate it. The images on the, on the top are of 2019. We uh, kicked it off with a, a grand opening with a steel band and that was a wonderful year. It is uh, a popular outdoor living room for the city and it's, a, a, it's transformed that corner of the park. What you see on the bottom is what you see today, is a place that is not activated. It's not a safe year to come out and have tables and chairs. And even our food truck operators chose not to come out. They have been losing money in the locations that they are uh, uh, operating in the city. So they chose not to come to Brewer Plaza. And you feel, it, you feel it's a sad year and it's a, a tough year because positive activity uh, is key in making this a comfortable, safe, welcoming place. Another thing we don't have out this year are the pilot bathrooms, which we had for two years. And it's another thing we heard a lot about in the master plan process so far is that we need more public bathrooms in the park. And we're thinking about different places to have them and, and how they can be uh, operated safely and successfully. 
we had 800 people a day coming to these bathrooms. So it was clearly a, a driving need in the park when there's so many people coming here that we need them. And we thank the Harold Whitworth Pierce Charitable Trust for such generous support in making it possible. And as soon as we can get back out there, hopefully next year, we'll be able to be out there again with them. This is a big project. It's a, a very impressive project. This is one of the 10 monuments that changed America. Uh, and what you see now is this deconstruction. Uh, on the left is a picture of it in place, and on the right is one of the marble eagles that has been taken off in the last couple of weeks. Every piece is being taken off of the monument. A couple of weeks ago, I went and actually got up on top of the scaffolding and was able to, to see the work on, on the top. It was very uh, inspiring to see actually how hard it is to very safely and carefully take off each piece, crate it up, and then the stone goes to a stone conservation studio, the bronze goes to a bronze conservation studio. The bronze will be removed next week and they're creating a cage to again safely and uh, easily remove that and, and bring that to the studio. But as you know, I think many of you came to some of these events. It's been really a wonderful opportunity to use this restoration as a platform for dialogue on race and justice in the country um, and working with the Museum of African American History as well as the National Park Service in the city. We had a series of events last year in the upper left. It was our conversation, the power of public monuments and why they matter at Tremont Temple. 500 people came. It was a really dynamic conversation. It's one that we have to have again and we will be having again. So we're having a series of virtual conversations. And the first one, uh, mark your calendars. We will be letting you know about this, but uh, August 24th at six o'clock, we're having a reprise of monuments and the power of public monuments. Renee Ader, our uh, art historian who was in that last forum, will be in conversation with uh, David Blight, who is a historian and the uh, biographer of du uh, Frederick Douglass and is a member of our honorary committee. In the upper right was an event in uh, mid-October that we call Restoring the Memorial on the Dialogue on Race and some dynamic presentations by our, our partners. And then we unveiled the signage, um, interpretive signage and the augmented reality app. And then Glory, we screened twice last year, once on the Common and once in uh, Emerson College with uh, Representative Byron Rushing coming each time to introduce the movie. And then at Emerson, he and historian Marty Blatt, both of them are on our committee, uh, uh, led a talk back about the movie. The director of the movie said that the inspiration for, for making this movie was the Shaw 54th Memorial. And please go to our website uh, and the web page, which is a joint website of the four partners, is Shaw54MemorialRestoration.org, and you can download the app. It tells the story of the regimen, the uh, work of Augustus St. Gaudens, and the monument's role through time for as a touchstone for political and social. Uh, gatherings and protests. It, uh, it, there are three holograms of uh, actors. Emmett Sykes, who is in the 54 Three and Actors, uh, author Carol Fulp, and Professor Ted Landsmark. And on the right are some images of our interpretive signage. As one of you said, it did get blown down in that windstorm of this week, but the National Park Service and ourselves and uh, Cambridge Landscape uh, came there very quickly as soon as it was safe to do that and, and righted the, the uh, fencing and we will make sure it's in terrific shape for you to enjoy. But here is our President Emeritus Henry Lee. I uh, called him up to look at the um, exhibit the day after it was up and we spent a wonderful hour looking at it. He knows about this more deeply probably than anybody. His great grandfather advised uh, the mayor, Mayor Andrew, to choose um, Robert Gould's jaw to, to lead the 54th and his great grandfather was one of the three men committee that chose Augustus St. Gaudens to do the memorial. So what Henry is reading here is the panel that talks about our first capital campaign in 1981 to restore the memorial. And then on the bottom, there's some posters calling men to arms, a thousand men from uh, Canada up and down the Eastern seaboard and the Caribbean joined the 54th. Last year, we had Duckling Day and Making History on the Common in the, the park. These are wonderful events. Uh, Making History, we started in our 40th anniversary, so it's now over 10 years old. And this year, we had to do those virtually, but we were committed to bringing them to you virtually. So on the lower left, Rondella Richardson, uh, 
Channel 5 anchor, who's been our MC for years in Duckling Day, read the story of Make Way for Ducklings to Kids. And on the right, we had a number of activities to bring making history to uh, children and their parents at home. We also had a number of other opportunities to bring outdoor fun to you, uh, coloring pages and a scavenger hunt bingo. Um, we know that parents and their children have spent five long months in the, the pandemic uh, moment at home and, and whatever we can do to bring the parks to you and to support you in this time, we, we want to do that. This is our 50th anniversary and these parks have been at the center stage of civic life for many, many years and we are proud of our half century of work on them. And as uh, several people have said, it's not the year that we anticipated, but it is still a year that we're celebrating, celebrating 50 years of working in partnership with, with the city and with all of you. If it wasn't for your support, we could not do the work that we do. And there are many uh, events that we couldn't hold this year because of the pandemic, but a couple of things we could. And one of them is uh, the BioBlitz. And thank you so much for the young friends who have uh, taken charge of this and, and helped to make it happen. We had a webinar this week with uh, Colleen Hitchcock, who is an ecology professor at Brandeis, and she's an expert in citizen science. So she helped people understand how to go to the app iNaturalist, download it, and help us with our challenge. It's a month long. Our goal is to have 2,500 observations and 400 species. If you missed the webinar this week, it will be on the website. So we encourage you to come and find all the critters that you can in our parks. We are uh, in deep in planning for three transformative park projects in each of the parks. In the public garden, we are rejuvenating the Arlington Street entrance. That is the major iconic entrance into this first public botanical garden in the country. And the two child fountains on either side of the entrance you see in this illustration have not worked for decades. So you come into this major entrance and it's quite a disappointment to see two fountains that don't work. So we are restoring those two fountains. We're rejuvenating the planting at the entrance, which has gotten old and tired and overgrown. We are adding benches near each of the, of the fountains to encourage people to come and enjoy the space. And we look forward to this. We are also raising money for endowment. As we have said before, we always make sure that when we do projects, we don't just raise money for the project, but we raise money to take care of it long term. On Commonwealth Avenue Mall, we're professionally lighting all the statues. This is a long time goal and desire, particularly of our Commonwealth Avenue Mall Chair, Margaret Pokorny. She's been trying for 30 years to make this happen. So we're particularly excited that it's happening this year. And last year we lit Samuel Elliott Morrison. We have a wonderful group of people that is helping us raise that money. We're very thankful for everyone that has been helping us in each of these projects. This year we're focusing on the Collins. It goes into construction in mid-September. But the famous supply chain challenge we're having in this pandemic might mean that not all the parts of the fixtures will be available and able to be um, installed by the end of the year. We are hoping that they will. We would love to have another celebration this year on Collins and continue down the mall with each of these statues. We're particularly excited about this project in the common. It's called What Do We Have in Common? It's a temporary art installation we're doing in collaboration with uh, curators now and there. And we have hired public artist Janet Zweig, who's nationally known. She came up last fall and immersed herself in the common and in the work that we do and in the history of the common. And she came up with a question that now is more relevant than ever before. It is not just going to be an object in a space, but it's going to be an interaction. So what you see in this illustration is two people in blue coveralls. They will have the question, what do we have in common on those coveralls? And they'll be engaging with the public about what does it mean to have resources in common, this place in common? And what does it take to take care of this common place? And how can commons practices help to create a more equitable future and equitable space? The boxes that you see down there are gonna be in locked compartments in the cabin, up to 200 boxes. On each of the boxes will be etched a question. Who owns the grass? Who owns the squirrels? Who owns history? They will be backlit with LED lights and at, at the end of every day, these workers will be putting those in the wheelbarrow, reflecting the, the actual care that happens on the common, wheeling them around to different sites in the park and installing them. So at the end of a month, 200 lit questions will be dotted all across that landscape. 
we're very excited about this project and we are looking forward to it being in next fall. We hope that it would be this fall, but again, because of the year that it was, we are looking forward to having this installation next fall. I wanna thank all of our park partners. I know a number of you are on the call today. You see that the city is full of green space. As you heard from Ryan, we have hundreds of, of park partners that support the city's work. And in fact, half of the green space in, in Boston is uh, state lands, is uh, overseen by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. These parks, as Leslie said, are not amenities. They are necessities. We work not only within the Friends, but we work with Boston Park Advocates, which is a citywide network of uh, advocates who want us, we need to speak with one voice. We have the work that we need to do in each of our parts, but it's very important to tell the powers that be that parks need to be supported. If a city is going to be livable and healthy and resilient, green space is at the heart of that. So thank you for doing the work that you do and thank you for working with us. And now I'm happy to turn this over for questions and comments. I think we hopefully have some questions in the chat and Leslie, maybe you'll take a look at those or uh, Laura, might, you might be able to help us look at those questions. Yeah, you, there was an interesting question. If you wanted to say a few words, it said about the liability on the financial performance slide for pilot bathrooms. Uh, fiscal sponsorship. So maybe either Liz or, or Bill might talk. Liz, you probably can speak a little bit to how we've been able to underwrite the pilot programs through the ha Harold Whitworth Pierce Trust. Yeah, no, we, we got a significant uh, funding for, for them. Uh, we do have an agreement with the city to run them. We hire a security firm that's there from seven o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night. We have cleaning three, four times a day and uh, pumping out constantly. So it's very important that we have as much eyes on that place as possible during the day because that is one of the challenges in having public bathrooms. And that will be one of the challenges as we Im implement ideas for bathrooms throughout the, the common is how can we make them safe? The other question we have is, are you planning any sort of capital campaign around the 50th anniversary? So I'll take a stab at a, a little of that and Bill might jump in as well who is uh, one of our co-chairs of our 50th anniversary campaign. Yes, we are, uh, we do have a, a capital campaign. It is currently a $4.6 million campaign and it's comprised of the three projects that Liz discussed in her slides. So the complete restoration of the Arlington Street entrance and the child fountains in the public garden the continuing lighting of the sculptures uh, along the Commonwealth Avenue Mall, and the installation of the uh, temporary art in the Boston Common. We're incredibly fortunate that we have raised um, a portion uh, of the funds already. We had a very, very generous donor who made a donation um, to us on the Arlington Street entrance. Uh, of a half a million dollars. Um, we've had several donations made for the temporary art installation. And Liz, you can speak, or Bill can speak to the detail. I, I know that the Commonwealth Avenue Lighting Mall has been a significant project and we've already begun that. And uh, you can speak perhaps to the numbers of where we are on that. We have raised 50% of what we need for the mall, which is really exciting. I think one of the nice things about the mall project is that it is such a neighborhood. It is, it is down the center of the neighborhood and many people fall in love with individual sculptures. So people that have you know, given to the Morrison are often in that neighborhood. Of course, people love the Morrison and, and, and contribute to it beyond that, but that's how we've been able to engage the public and engage interest. And we are 50% of the way on that $1.75 million project. Project. I think I would just add <clears throat> that, of course, we planned this campaign long before COVID-19. And uh, fortunately, the Friends already has uh, a large number of endowments, some of which really just uh, go towards our everyday work. So we have not felt the need to have a capital campaign addressing the shortfalls that we may have in the future that uh, other nonprofits who are not as well established uh, as we are. I mean, this is where our $23 million endowment uh, is invaluable to us. 
And as Bill said, you know, this is a campaign and, and a 50th celebration that we began quite a while ago, not anticipating with where we would be. We decided that at the time we would focus our attentions on our main mission and taking a break. Uh, we will begin to engage uh, people in our membership though in uh, September on uh, more details around our capital campaign. So um, I do hope that helps with that question. Any other questions? I would, uh, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, like to take this opportunity to say a few things. You know, I would like to thank uh, Bill Clendaniel for all of his incredibly thoughtful and engaged leadership. Um, I've gotten to know Bill in my new, my, it's not new, but my role um, as the board chair these last three years. And he has been um, just an amazing partner to work with. I know that he's been supportive of, of our work and so many other nonprofits in the city. And, um, you know, we're all so very fortunate for his efforts uh, in making us all better uh, at what we do. So I want to say thank you very much. Um, and as you voted for the election of our new board members, there were three members that I'd like to, to also thank who will be rotating off um, their six-year terms. Um, we have um, Alan Taylor, Catherine O'Keefe, and Ali Ackmeyer. So again, thank you for your six years of uh, support and persistent work with us uh, on the board. The other thing is Liz did mention that we were going to be posting a new role and I just wanted to give some clarity to that. Um, our um, development manager, many of you may have known, Mary Halpin, um, had gone on to a very exciting role a few weeks before the beginning of uh, the quarantine uh, with the Dimmick Health Center. And when she left us, we decided it was a good opportunity to um, take a look at our structure. And I want to thank a number of people on our board who did a lot of work in looking at our organization and structure. Um, and so that the role we've created is a new uh, senior role as a director of development and communications. Um, and so that will be, I think, a, a great support to Liz as she begins to uh, take on uh, more of her advocacy role as president. So thank you all very much for that. I don't see any other questions. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening.